Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. I'm chatting with Matt Battiali, editor of the New Energy Investor, published under the Mangrove Investor, which I will post a link to in the show notes, as Matt and I usually do on a about bi-weekly basis, is touch on the critical minerals industry, what's newsworthy, what some of the rumors are that Matt's been hearing and Matt, you brought to my attention vanadium flow batteries. I I've heard of these batteries before, but I hadn't really dove in simply because, look, we get a lot of battery news and there's a lot of advancements happening in the battery space. And undoubtedly, at least in my mind, there are going to be these disruptive technologies and batteries that really change the outlook for the battery sector. Vanadium flow batteries, as we were chatting, once I was doing a little bit more research on them, these do seem to fit a lot of the issues that some of these large scale battery build outs seem to have. They seem scalable. They have all kinds of other benefits over, let's just say, lithium ion batteries. So, Matt, in terms of what you've been hearing about the potential of vanadium flow batteries, break it down for us, please. Yeah. So the first thing we have to talk about is this is not these aren't going in electric vehicles. So that's not where this is. This is the holy grail of batteries lately has been these kind of grid scale batteries. And that's what, that's where lithium batteries really aren't ideal. That lithium, as you probably know, is a serious fire hazard. And if you put enough of this lithium together <laughs> to handle the enormous flows of, of electricity for a grid, you have a pretty significant risk there because you can't put them out. When lithium starts to burn, forget it. You just have to let it burn itself out. So you you need something that is less reactive. I, I, I've had a couple of good laughs at some of the ideas. I mean, one of the leading techs for a little while was molten sodium battery. And I was like, I don't want that anywhere near my house either. But vanadium offers a lot of benefits. Um, the one of the big benefits is that, that it has a long lifespan. So if you're going to invest in a, a, a big battery storage center, battery energy storage center, you don't want to have to re replace them every five years. And, and vanadium flow batteries look like they can last up to 25 years. Um, they can get really big without having the same kind of risks that lithium ions have. And then they're not as energy dense as lithium ion batteries, but that's okay. Because you, you don't have the same, like energy density matters when weight matters. So in vehicles, it really matters. You don't want to have a big, clunky, heavy battery. The lighter the battery, the smaller the battery you can get, the better it is. That's where the energy density matters. But if you're just parking a whole bunch of these things out in a lot, it doesn't matter if it weighs a little bit more or if it's a little larger. So grid scale batteries, here's the critical aspect of them. They do two things. The first thing that they do is they take a lot of the risk out of renewables like wind and solar. So the risk with wind and solar is that demand for electricity happens sometime when it's not windy or it's night. So, you know, that they're not working. So with a battery, you can charge it all day when it's from a solar array. And then when you have demand at night, you can supply it back into the market. The other thing that batteries do is they even out the market. So right now, electricity prices are highly variable uh, and it's demand-based. So in the morning when everybody wakes up and they turn on their stove and they turn on their hair dryer, um, they throw laundry in the dryer real quick to spruce things up, you get a massive energy draw and the price goes up because the demand goes up. The middle of the day, things come back down and at night when everybody gets home, they turn on the TV, they turn on the dishwasher, all that stuff. Again, the price goes up. And then at night, everything turns every, uh, everybody turns everything off. Demand goes to almost zero and the energy supply gets a lot less expensive. If you have batteries that are large enough, they can resupply when nobody's using electricity and then feed into the market when you get peaks in demand. And what that will do is flatten out the price so it becomes very uh, useful in terms of the, the cost to us as consumers, but also, like I said, you know, being able to store 
energy from these intermittent producers like wind and solar and feeding it into demand when it happens. So we're going to see a lot of these, but right now it's China that's really driving demand for these vanadium flow batteries and the scale of these things, the projected growth is off the charts. Well, hey, Matt, of course it's China driving the demand for these, right? That seems to be China's gig is driving demand for some maybe underappreciated type of technologies. But what comes next? What do we need to look for? Because when I was doing some research on it, we're not seeing a whole lot of these large scale initiatives being built. It sounds like there's still a lot of studies that need to be done in them. So are you seeing any advancements in terms of actual build outs of vanadium flow battery plants? No, China's kind of opaque when it comes to that. What I am seeing is, for example, there's a, an, a group called Roskill that, that their analysts are saying that while vanadium demand from uh, steel, which is its primary use right now, is low, that the demand from uh, these flow batteries uh, will grow at a compound annual growth rate of 56.7% per year through 2030. So the part of that is it's starting small, but I think part of that is that, that China is going to be ramping these things up really quickly. Nobody in my neighborhood is starting a vanadium flow battery plant. And we haven't seen a bunch of juniors come into the vanadium market though, have we? But we, we do know that there are some juniors out there in terms of production though. What, what do we see? Who are some vanadium miners or larger companies that could lead the market? Yeah. So right now, the Canadian company to, to look at is somebody called Largo. Largo Resources symbols LGO. And when you look at them, it's hard to reconcile what you're seeing. I mean, these guys are, they're in production. They just filed their Q1. They generated $42 million in Q1 versus $57 million in last year because the vanadium price fell. It was uh, $9 a pound last year, and it's about $7 a pound this year. And so they had revenue of $42 million bucks on costs of 50 So they're not making any money. And so you would expect when you go and look at that price chart that they're not doing very well, and you'd be, you'd be correct. Their share price has fallen 90%, 80% since 2022. They went from almost 10 bucks a pound to under two. They've bounced back up. They're about 260 now. But I mean, this is a company that generates 100 and some odd million dollars a year in revenue. But it's mostly because the, the price of, of vanadium has just absolutely cratered. By the way, just for... If you guys go and look at the Largo price chart, this was a $22 company in 2021 that fell to under two bucks this year. So that's how bad the, the vanadium market got out over its skis. The thing about vanadium right now is it's still tied to steel making and steel hasn't been all that great. But we do, to get back to your question, Corey, we do see some deals happening. So Flying Nickel just acquired Nevada Vanadium Mining Pella Resources, which is a APA on the CBE. They have some exploration properties. Northern Shield has some exploration properties. Energizer Resources has some exploration properties, but these are all little companies. And, and most of these things are early stage not in production. So really Largo is the company that I've got my eye on. We don't own it, but it's something that I'm going to keep my eye on possibly for putting in the letter down the road, because I want exposure to these, exactly these kind of metals, because this is how lithium, this is how the lithium boom started, right? It's happened in a lot of different metals markets though, right? In these, especially small ones, they are subject to some of the biggest moves. Just look at what happened in 2018, right? When I'm seeing Largo and the vanadium price both went on a massive run together. Of course, as you said, they have both corrected, but these smaller metals markets, while the runs sometimes can be short because they're so small, they can offer the biggest upside runs. But again, the biggest question then, is it needing the market to 
switch focus and say, okay, vanadium, it's more of a battery metal now than simply just used for steel? Yeah, I think that's exactly what hap- has to happen. I mean, to use lithium as an example, uh, historically, nobody cared about lithium. It was a byproduct from fertilizer production for the most part. It was used in Greece and it was used in some paints and it really didn't have a, it, it was an, it was a, you know, an other, the other mineral that you got out of mining potash and you could sell it, but it wasn't really a, a profit center. And so because demand wasn't there, supply really wasn't there either. You don't want to oversupply it. So you just kind of, you produced it and went on your way. But what we saw when lithium ion batteries blew up was that you can create demand for these metals way faster than you can meet supply. And so that's why the prices of these things react so quickly, because with lithium, if you're a lithium producer you're a, and it's a byproduct, you've got to think a lot about, do you really want to put the money into like the capex in to develop more supply of this stuff when nobody really gave crap for so long. Right. And so vanadium is there right now. Like vanadium producers have to think twice about the capex that they need, especially go back to Largo. Largo is losing money. They're producing hundred plus million dollars worth of vanadium and losing money on every pound they produce. So Do they really want to expand production? So supply is nowhere near as dynamic as demand. And as we see this, as China builds out its battery production facilities, I guarantee you that they have domestic supply. And so what will have to happen is domestic supply in China will be diverted away from steel manufacturing into their battery plants. Then the steel makers are going to have to start looking around because suddenly they're competing with Chinese demand. And so the price is going to begin to move. And then you'll see that same slow trickle upward effect until it hits critical mass. And we see 50 um, Canadian juniors rename themselves from Marijuana Co. to Vanadium Co. Oh, that's when we know we've hit the top, right? Yeah, Yeah, that's it. (laughs) We've all seen that before, but it sounds like potentially we could be early on here. Are there any general area plays that you're looking at where there does seem to be a lot of vanadium or people have had success finding vanadium? Yes, that's a very good question. Believe it or not, Canada has some pretty interesting vanadium-rich areas, and it's eastern, so eastern Ontario, Quebec. So yeah, the, there are some really interesting deposits there that I'm keeping an eye on. So then what other news events do you think could drive this vanadium market? What could change the overall, I guess, boring nature of it right now or depressed nature and price? Yeah, I think it all comes down to the China and and it'll be the pace of the Chinese rollout of these batteries. The, the, the idea that this, that the compound annual growth rate from now till 2030 is 56, 57% a year is kind of astonishing. And so what, if that's true, it won't take very long for this to hit the kind of start to impact the market. We're talking about this briefly offline, and I think it's a conversation for another call. It's how much weight and how much faith you have in these estimates. We're kind of at the mercy of these analysts, but we also know that China is a command economy. And so if these grid scale batteries are this important and vanadium does fit the bill the way people are projecting it to, this could happen really quickly, Corey. I think really quickly. All right. Well, it's something for us to watch out for then. Hey, Matt. And hey, as I said, these small markets, boy, oh boy, can they really get moving when more interest comes. And sometimes when there's just these news catalysts and more interest comes into them, we'll pay attention to the vanadium market. I'll follow up with you to see even what happens in the vanadium market. I found it funny. I was trying to search for the vanadium price and I found vanadiumprice.com. That website's not even online yet. They have a countdown now in a couple of weeks. So maybe this is telling you things. Yeah, are maybe, maybe we're breaking news here. Exactly. <laughs> Who knows? But thanks for bringing that to my attention. 
Matt, I'll do a little bit more looking into some of these vanadium flow batteries. And, well, we'll watch this market, see if there is a trade or some investable opportunity in the near term. Matt, thank you. And again, Matt is the editor of the New Energy Investor, published under the Mangrove Investor, which I will link to in the show notes. Matt, have a great rest of your week. You too, thanks.